Hello, hello, and welcome to my Sunday thought, and I'm doing it on Sunday, which is a red letter day. Um, and I am, as always, uh, reminding you that I have a book. It's called Getting the Last Laugh, and uh, it's on Amazon, and it's the story of how you make your dreams come true, and it's a story of uh, perseverance. Um, but it also is indicative of what I have been doing all my life, which is writing books, because I love to read. And the thing I wanted to talk to you about is that there was an, an out, uh, outraged article. I mean, the article was outraged because a woman was reading while she was driving. I can relate to that. I, I read constantly constantly and I cannot get enough um, information and I don't do a Kindle I do um, print um, and I'll and I have been reading for a very very long time I learned to read fluently when I was two and the reason I did is because my mother believed that every child should have a bowel movement every morning so every, and my mother did not like changing diapers, um, and they were using cloth diapers at that time. We've come back to that, uh, and um, it stunk up the house. I stunk up the house. So my mother was determined to toilet train me just as fast as she could. So every morning, from the moment I could be propped up, <laughs> she put me on the toilet in a potty seat with a book and left me there until I accomplished something. And that could be a very long time. And, uh, and she would leave me with a book. The books that she left me with uh, were called My Book House for Children. And I need to tell you about them. When my mother was pregnant, a sales lady knocked on her door and informed my mother that her child was like an iceberg you could only see us 80%, the 10% of it, 90% was below the surface, and you had to feed that child's mind. For some crazy reason that I think my mother regretted all her life, she decided to buy a set of books called My Book House for Children. It was at that time $100, and my mother spent $10 a month for 10 months so that she could feed my mind the part of the iceberg that you couldn't see. So before I went to bed at night, in order to uh, quiet me, and uh, even when I was little, I was a night person, and it was very hard to get me to go to sleep at night, um, I, I, and very hard to wake me up in the morning, which is still the way I am. Everyone knows me. I stay up till 3 in the morning. I get up at 11 um, there's a book called Sleep Till Noon and uh, uh, by Perlman. It's by Perlman. who says Sleep Till Noon and Screw Them All. So I have one more hour to sleep before I can start screwing everyone. But right now I sleep till 11. Um, so my mother got my book house for children. And every night before I, uh, she put me to sleep, she would read me nursery rhymes from book one, which had a lovely picture of a little girl in a bonnet uh, I think she was picking flowers, and read me uh, those nursery rhymes. Then she would put me, when she put me on the pot uh, to have a dump, she um, left me with this book that she had read to me the night before. And that is how I learned to read. And I can still remember being shocked when I went into the first grade. They did not teach reading uh, in kindergarten at that time. Uh, and realized that the other children didn't know those words. But the interesting thing is that I couldn't pronounce any of them. I couldn't pronounce them. I knew what they were and I knew what they meant, but I didn't know how to say them. So that S-O-S-I-E-T-Y was society. I called it society for years and years and years. And I still um, mispronounce many words. There's um, a rice dish, R-I-S-O-T-T-O, that is supposed to be pronounced in the French manner, and I still call it risotto. And I try not to, but I just do. But reading uh, has been um, my escape. 
And if you read my book, you will know that I had, uh, my childhood was a prison. And my mother was the warden. And my sister was the chief uh, officer. And my childhood was a prison. And I escaped it by reading. What I used to do, and I, w I would walk to the public library, which was a it was Kent Library in Toledo, Ohio, which was, I'm guessing it was a good three miles from my house. And I walked there, and at that time you could get, and I'm guessing, I know it was a great man, but I believe it was something like seven books or eight books. And I went there and I took eight books, and I came home when I was very little, uh, I'm still little, but I was really little <laughs> when I was little. <laughs> and I would carry these books. They were so high you couldn't see. And I would come home, and my mother was absolutely determined that I would be a, a neighborhood social success. So my mother would always say to me, she would always dress me in hand-me-downs from my cousin Sandy because she said I wasn't good enough uh, to get new clothes. And she would send me outside and she would say, now go play and don't get dirty. And I would stand and wait until she called me in for lunch. But as soon as I was old enough, and that was when I was three and four, uh, as soon as I was old enough, I walked to Kent Library because she wouldn't take me. And I would get my seven or eight books. It might have been even more, but it was so many that I know I couldn't see the street. I used to have to look to the side. And I remember that Kent Library was, at the, was on Collingwood Avenue, if I remember correctly. But it was quite a long way from where we lived. And I would come home, and I would put these books in my room. And I know I was over eight, because as I recall this, it was the second house. And I would go into my mother's, because I didn't want my mother to send me out and make me play, because I was lousy at tag. Oh, I was terrible. I couldn't play any of the games that anyone played, any of the games. I couldn't, we used to do pick up sticks, and I always just messed it up. We would do tag, and I got caught all the time. Fell off my little bicycle all the time. Uh, I was just a complete social failure. So in order that my mother wouldn't see me and make me go outside and stand there and stare at all the children playing, I would go into the hall closet and my mother at that time had a, a seal coat. Um, I am uh, appalled when I see a fur coat with an animal skin now. But then I wasn't. Uh, and I never associated it with the animal. But it was a seal coat. And if you know anything about seal fur, it's so soft. It's so soft you can't believe. And you push it down and it's dark and up and it's light, and I would sit there with the light on in the hall closet with my face against my mama's seal coat and the door shut so she didn't know I was in there, and I would read these seven or eight books and get them done in two weeks and then go back to the library again to get more. And as a result, uh, I believe you had to be 12 to get a, a library card for the Toledo Main Library. And there aren't many things that I think are nice about Toledo, but our main library was gorgeous. It was gorgeous. It was brand new when I was little. And it was gorgeous. It had beautiful murals. And and you could take the bus and, and, and for, for a penny, for a penny. And you could get off right in front of the public library. And because I had read all the books in Kent Library by the time I was 10, they gave me a special card and I was allowed to use the main library. And so I would go down to the main library and the children's department was up, I still remember it, was up a big open staircase. And I would go up that staircase and I would read, and I'm sorry, I wish I could say I read Shakespeare and Proust and I didn't. I read Janet Lambert, Cherry Ames, Girl Nurse. I read children's trash. Um, but oh my God, I love my books, love my books. And I would take all those books home and I would read them in the hall closet. So when I got older, um, always books, I bought books constantly. And I remember what I loved best 
about graduating from the University of Michigan was not that I graduated with honors, but that now I could read whatever I wanted. And when I was 50, I started writing, writing books. I've written, I believe, 17 now. And I always said, I'm really writing these books because I never want to run out of things to read. And I read now, of course, on the tube and on the bus. I read while I eat. I have a special book stand. And I read um, before I go to bed. And during the beginning of this lockdown, I also read uh, for an hour every afternoon because I wasn't taking any buses. And I read approximately, I'm guessing, depending on the length of the book, four books a week. Uh, and that's in addition to everything else that I do. Um, I, I, Kindle doesn't do it for me. I need a real book with real pages that I can turn. And I mark books. I put when something special uh, happens. So I'm going to conclude this by telling you about uh, some of the books uh, that I've been reading because they are, I happen to be reading some really wonderful books. So I'm going to tell you some wonderful books and remind you about my wonderful book and, and know, very proud of myself, that I gave you a Sunday thought on Sunday. But I just finished Leo Rostin's The Joy of Yiddish. I read it for the jokes, but this time, which is about my third time through, I read it for what it said. And there are many, especially now, there are many uh, derogative uh, remarks about the Jewish religion, uh, especially because I live in a Hasidic community, and the Jewish people in the Hasidic community are very solipsistic. And I've always said it's not the Jewish that I know from Toledo, Ohio. And when I read Leo Rostin, I realize that he knew the same kind of Jewish I did. It is incumbent upon Jews. It is a law that you must help anyone who is needy. You must, not you should, or you... And, and then his joke about that is absolutely marvelous. Jews always have a little box it's a little blue box, and you put coins in it, and uh, we put coins in it to build trees in Israel. And there's a comedian named uh, Ivor Dambina who went to Israel, and he had put coins in the little box to buy trees. And when he went to Israel, he said, yes, I'm happy to be here because I own property here. But the joke that Leo Rostin says is uh, because little Jewish children are taught that that's what you must do. You help anyone in need. So it is a, a class, and it's a fifth grade class, and the teacher is saying, let's hear about your hobbies. And uh, Susan Jones gets up and says, I am 10 years old, and I collect stamps. And um, Johnny Smith gets up and says, I am 10 years old, and I play baseball. And Nathan Schwartz gets up and says, I am 10 years old, and I donate $5, <laughs> because that's what we do. Uh, it, is, it is important for us to be good to others and to accept others and to accept their beliefs. We do not proselytize. And Leo Rustin writes about that. And if you go beyond the jokes, and of course the jokes are so funny, how can you do that? But you go beyond the jokes, you'll see that he gives a beautiful picture of, of a faith that has sustained itself through much negativity, much uh, prejudice, as many other faiths have. But it gives you a very different picture of Judaism. You don't get the grasping materialistic Jew you don't get the artificial, of course we make jokes about it, the artificial, superficial Jewish princess. And my favorite joke about that is um, the Jewish tragedy uh, that was on Netflix was called Debbie Does Dishes. I always love that. <laughs> and um, what does a Jewish princess make for dinner reservations? But those are jokes, but those aren't the way the religion is. And the religion... You never walk into a Jewish home and they don't feed you. Uh, 
we feed people. We consider uh, the highest charity preventing poverty. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. So that's Leo Rostam, The Joys of Yiddish. And the other thing I am reading, which is tearing my heart out, is Dancing with Rose by Lauren Kessler. Dancing with Rose. And it's about a woman who's Lauren Kessler, whose mother died of Alzheimer's and how impatient and angry she was at this woman's prolonged death. Not because she was insensitive, but because with Alzheimer patients, you don't realize that what they're doing is not deliberate. And they don't know who you are. And they don't, one of the things she talks about is how her mother forgot how to swallow. But she decided, because she didn't understand her mother's death, and because she still had a great deal of rage in her, that she would go work at an Alzheimer unit. And I believe it's in Portland, Oregon. I believe that's where it is. Um, and she would get to understand the disease. I'm now just at the beginning of it. I cannot put it down. Because what you realize is, first of all, that these people have lost themselves. They have lost themselves. And their caregivers are underpaid, underappreciated, and overworked. And how we, as compassionate human beings, can put a human person into one of these homes that treat them like furniture and force others to take care of them without compensating them for what should be an act of mercy and an act of love is, is absolutely heartbreaking. That's Lauren Kessler, Dancing with Rose. Um, those are my two that I'm reading right now. There will be more. I'm also reading The Milkman, and that's by a lovely Irish girl. And if you're interested in the real guts of the Irish troubles, read that too. So thank you very much. I've gone on too long, but when it comes to books, I always go on too long. I'm going to remind you, this is getting the last laugh, but I've also written many others. I've written Starving Hearts, which is on Amazon, which is about uh, anorexia. Uh, and about my first marriage. My favorite is The Late Bloomer, uh, which you can get in England, uh, but if anyone wants uh, one of these books, um, you should write me directly, and I will post it to you if you're willing to pay the postage from England. If you're in America, uh, I will send it to you. If you're in England, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, it's called The Late Bloomer, and it's about a woman named Fanny, and everybody in London knows that Fanny is actually uh, a... A, a name for a vagina, but this is not about her vagina. It's about a little overweight, um, darling little woman named Fanny Goldstein uh, and about uh, her, the way she bloomed. And then I have two books of short stories called Thoughts While Walking the Dog and More Thoughts While Walking the Dog. You can get all those. But I also have um, 11 more books that you can't get because nobody wanted them and I haven't been willing to invest the money in publishing them because as I said, I write books so I'll never run out of anything to read. And thank you so much for joining me for my, my thought on Sunday.